random move went down the floor. John. In previous episodes, we discussed how the Juon franchise started life as two shorts, made for the TV anthology movie Gakko no Kaiden G. This was quickly followed by two director video feature length movies, Juon the Curse 1 and 2. Juon the Grudge was the first movie in the series to be made for theatrical distribution, getting its premiere at Screamfest in 2002. Before we get into the plot breakdown, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button and ring the ding dong for notifications of future movie reviews. Like the cursed movies before it, Jew on the Grudge is essentially six connected short films told out of order. The movie begins with an episode entitled Rika. Rika volunteers at a social welfare centre. She is cornered by a boss who presses her into going on a home visit. Rika doesn't feel confident going alone as she is relatively inexperienced. I have to say, you might be a bit of a dick splash, but that is an outstanding pair of buggers grips. Yeah, I'm guessing HR has a file on that guy. Rika is sent to the home of the Tokunaga family. She's been asked to look in on an elderly lady, as the previous carer has disappeared and is uncontactable. She finds the house in a mess, the bedding skid marked, and the old dear home alone in a catatonic state. Upstairs, she discovers a wardrobe that's been sealed with packing tape. She's still unresponsive, so Rika goes back to talk to the boy and finds out his name is Toshio. Toshio. A murmuring from the old lady's room draws Rika back in. pick up Rika's story in a later episode. For now we go back in time to tell the story of Katsuya. Katsuya is the son of the old deer from the previous episode. He's recently moved into the house with his mother and his wife Kazumi. Heading out for work, Kazumi reminds him that his sister is coming for dinner that evening. Later, while catching 40 winks, Kazumi is woken by a disturbance which she thinks was caused by her mother-in-law. A cat has got into the house. Kazumi follows it upstairs, where it is grabbed by a pale pair of hands. The ghostly figure runs into one of the bedrooms, with Kazumi following. Hours later, Katsuya returns home from work. He finds Kazumi catatonic on the fart sack. <laughs> so, are you going to call that ambulance? Okay, there's nothing there. Are you going to call the ambulance?
What do you think you're going to find in there? Call an ambulance. Dude. Why are you putting your phone in your trousers? Are you going to dial with your penis? You're not going to find an ambulance under there. Oh, for the love of Jeff. Katsuya's your sister Hitomi arrives. Konbanwa. A malevolent force casts a shadow over Katsuya, possessing him and turning his expression evil. Hitomi starts making the dinner while Katsuya carries his wife's body into another room. Hearing movement coming from upstairs, Hitomi goes to investigate. Katsuya is on the stairs. He babbles about his wife cheating on him and their child not being his. In a moment of clarity, he pushes Hitomi out of the door. <laughs> Back inside, Katsuya is possessed again by the evil spirit. We jump forward in time now in an episode that runs concurrently with Rika's. Hitomi has been attempting to contact Katsuya since he forced her out of the house. Her teeth are floating so she dashes into the ladies. In the cubicle her phone rings. The caller ID says it's from her brother. Tomi fetches a security guard who goes to check on her story. Despite all these lights being on, and these side lights, he still has to use a torch. Hitomi watches the security footage as a black cloud emerges from the bathroom and grabs the security guard by the no-no spot. Hitomi GTFOs and runs all the way back to her apartment. At home she takes a moment to remember her fallen comrade. Back home, Hitomi finally receives a phone call from Katsuya. He was on his way over to see her. Hi. Uh, the conversation is barely finished before the doorbell rings. Hitomi dives into her wanking chariot and hides under the covers.
Much of this movie is reminiscent of the legend of Tsukima Ona, or the Gap Woman. The legend was first written down by Nagishi Yasumori, who lived from the late 18th to early 19th centuries. For 30 years he collected stories and anecdotes, and published them in a 10-volume book called Mimi Bakuru. In the original story, a young man is overwhelmed by the feeling he's being watched. Eventually he finds that there is a woman living in the few millimetres gap between his dresser and the wall. Over the years, the story has been retold and evolved. In some versions of the story, the Gap Woman will drag her victims into another dimension. Some people attempt to stave off their fate by putting tape over every gap in their house. Moving home won't save them either, as the curse will follow them and spread to whoever enters their home. We now return you to your regularly scheduled program and pick up Rika's story again in the next episode, Toyama. I'm okay. Rika hasn't returned to the welfare centre, so her boss, Hirohashi, goes looking for her at the Tokanagas. He finds the old deer dead and Rika in a trance. Investigating the death, detectives call Katsuya's mobile and hear it ringing somewhere inside the house. Tracking the ringing down to the attic, they find Katsuya and Kazumi's dead bodies. Later, at the hospital, a recovering Rika tells one of the dicks about Toshio. She is told that the Tokanagas have no children. Back at police headquarters, Detective Exposition explains that Hitomi has gone missing and the security guard is dead. All the families who have lived in the Tokanaga's home have either died or disappeared. The first family it happened to were the Psyches. Five years ago, Takio Saiki murdered his wife Kayako and hid her body in the attic. Later, he was found dead in the street. They had a son, Toshio, who disappeared and is listed as missing. Searching for answers, Detective Exposition goes to see Yuji Toyama. Toyama was previously part of the investigation into the Psyche murders. He has subsequently left the force and is now the only surviving member of the team. Toyama is reluctant to get involved in the case again until he is informed that there have been more deaths related to the house. At the cop shop, Toyama is given the security footage from Hitomi's office building on the evening she disappeared. He watches as the security guard is led into the ladies by his junk. A black figure emerges into the corridor. It then appears directly in front of the camera and stares straight at Toyama. Rika is asleep at home when she is woken by Toshio standing next to her bed and Kayako staring down at her. I might be overthinking it, but I think this shot is channeling the nightmare. Toyama goes to the Tokanaga's house with two cans of petrol, intent on torching the joint. It's night time but he sees daylight streaming through the kitchen door. On the other side of the door he sees a vision of a teenage girl running from the house. Upstairs there are three more teens who are suddenly attacked by something out of sight. <coughs> then night returns as Kayako crawls into view. <laughs> he stumbles downstairs where he is found by the detectives who have tracked him down. Toyama makes it out of the door as Kayako advances on them. On the way into school, Izumi catches sight of a poster of three missing girls, Saori, Chiaki and Ayano. 
the three teenagers that Toyama saw in his vision at the Tokunaga's house. Izumi is the girl he saw running from the house, his own daughter, now seven years older than when we last saw her tooting a recorder. At school, Izumi is looking at pictures from a recent outing. She doesn't appear in any of them, so her friends jostle one of the teachers about it. He promises to check the negatives and get some prints done, which will take about a week. Come on, it's not his fault. It's 2002. Back then, digital photos were about as sharp as a bag of wet mice. Back home, Izumi's mother sits quietly in front of a picture of Toyama. Its placement in front of an altar indicates that he is now dead. A week later, Izumi's chums, Chiharu and Miyuki, come round with the photos. Izumi looks like arse. She's covered her windows in newspaper and acts skittish. She tells them that on the day of the school trip, she went with the missing girls to a haunted house, the Tokunagas. She got the fear and ran away, as Toyama saw in his vision. The other girls stayed, and that was the last time they were seen alive. Since then, she has been haunted by their faces, appearing at her window. After they leave, they suddenly remember the photos. In every picture of Azumi and the missing girls, their eyes are blacked out. That night, Azumi dreams of her father. When she wakes, she finds strips of newspaper on her bed. The paper has been torn from her window. Through the gaps, her friends' faces stare at her. Izumi panics and books it to the room where she had seen her father, with her friends following. She makes a half assed attempt at barricading the door. I wanted to find out what this cabinet is that Izumi is pulled into. The room it's in is distinct in being decorated in the traditional Japanese style with tatami mats on the floor and unlike the rest of the house with its hinged doors it has translucent sliding doors called shoji. This suggests the room amongst other things may be used for religious practices. The fandom wiki says it's a Shinto altar. From what I could find Shinto altars or kamidana look like this usually with a rope of rice straw called Shimanawa, which demarcates it as a sacred area and hanging white paper symbolising purity. I might be talking bollocks, but I think it's a butsudan, a Buddhist altar that normally have two cabinet-style doors. Buddhists will keep the ashes, death certificates, or in this case a photo of a dead relative, in or around the altar. They will use it to ask for protection and guidance from their ancestors. Some denominations of Buddhism will enshrine ehai, or spirit tablets, in their boot sedan, which is what I believe these are. The posthumous name of the dead are written on the ehai, and the spirit of the dead lives on in them. This is suggested at the end of Izumi's dream, as Toyama shuffles towards the altar, as if he is returning to the ehai. Boot sedan will also contain a gohonzon, a religious icon, usually a statue or painting. I'm pretty sure this is a painting of Amitabha, a significant figure in Buddhism. Amitabha is said to have created a pure land, free from suffering, where people could achieve Buddhahood more quickly. Appeals to Amitabha, especially at the moment of death, can help people to be reborn into the pure land. The appearance of Izumi and Toyama in the altar implies their spirits now reside there. We now go back in time again and conclude Rika's storyline in the final episode Kayako. Rika is still working at the social welfare centre. Her client Mr Saito is playing peekaboo with someone she can't see. In a reflection, we get a brief glimpse of who it is. Back home while showering, Rika feels something touch the back of her head. Later she meets up with her friend Mariko, a teacher. Mariko complains about a pupil of hers that is enrolled at her school, 
but has never shown up for class and his parents aren't responding to her calls. Rika feels something fuzzy under the table. That afternoon she takes a nap and dreams of being dogpiled by cats. She's woken by a phone call from Mariko, who has called to check on her. Mariko is at the home of the boy who hasn't come to school and found him home alone. A sudden cat cry down the phone startles Rika. And at that moment, she realises where Mariko is. She legs it to the Tokunaga house, arriving just in time to see Mariko being dragged into the attic. Rika runs for the door, with Kayako crawling down the stairs behind her. Before she reaches her, Rika realises she is destined to relive the curse, as she sees herself as Kayako. Takio comes down the stairs to repeat the murder of his wife, this time with Rika as the victim. In the final shots we see a deserted Tokyo, littered with missing persons leaflets, and Rika's corpse in the attic, wrapped in plastic, just like Kayako before her. Juon's The Curse and The Grudge, along with the Gakko no Kaiden GTV episodes, were all written and directed by Takashi Shimizu and exist within the same continuity, though you don't need to have seen the previous entries in the franchise to follow the plot of The Grudge. Unlike The Curse, which was filmed on Shitio, The Grudge was filmed in 35mm by cinematographer Takusho Kikimura. Kikimura is a frequent collaborator with Kayoshi Kurosawa, who also directed an episode of Gakko no Kaidenji. Kurosawa was a mentor to Takashi Shimizu and served as creative consultant on The Grudge, along with Ringu screenwriter Hiroshi Takahashi. Even with a bigger budget than The Curse and more time on his side, Shimizu is still very economic in his directing style, with long takes and few camera setups. A good example can be seen here, in the scene where Hitomi fetches the security guard after she sees Kayako in the bathroom. The entire scene plays in a single shot from outside the room. The tight space of the room and the intruding exterior wall, symbolising how Atomi is now trapped in the curse. The calendar and clock on the walls representing how time is running out for her. The phone which should logically be placed on the desk, out of sight from our point of view, is placed in full view, foreshadowing the call Hitomi will get later in the evening, which signals the moment Kayako will finally come for her. The security guard has a lovely character moment here, squeezing Hitomi's shoulder as he leaves. He comes across as caring and paternalistic, with a reassuring confidence. This is reinforced by the way he figuratively grows, from a small background character, to dominating the frame, just before he steps out of the shot. For a character with less than two minutes of screen time, and a handful of lines, he comes across as an actual person, rather than a cipher. In the final frames, Shimizu resists going in for the close-up reaction shot, the empty space above her head making her look vulnerable and insecure. It's a simple unfussy setup, which says a lot without calling attention to itself. I've got to be honest though and say I found this movie a little less spoopy than The Curse. That may be because I saw The Curse first, and perhaps knowing the formula and backstory before going into this flick takes something away from it. Unfortunately, I can't go back and unwatch the curse to test my theory. That said though, there are still some very effective scares and scenes that have become iconic in the horror genre. Well, I think that's a wrap for today. 
don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and follow me on Twitter at 2movies where I'll be posting short videos and quick capsule reviews. And I'll see you next time for Jew on the Grudge 2.